By the way, this is going to be a very interactive session, meaning that everyone's going to get to practice. That's why the, the uh, chairs are set up in circles. And I initially requested tables, but they couldn't do tables because of the quick turnaround on the rooms. But um, if you're not in a circle, join a circle because you will be speaking to each other in your circle as part of the practice for today. Um, as Rachel mentioned, uh, I'm Jesse Shinto. I've been involved with the strategic communication program here at Columbia for 10 years now, hard to believe. And uh, I got my, uh, earned my master's degree here. Uh, then I became a lecturer in the program. Uh, spent a year as the associate director went away on my Fulbright, came back, picked up where I left off, and now I run my own uh, consulting business around public speaking, executive presence, persuasion. Uh, my company is called Public Sphere, and at the end of the, the session, I've got some uh, reprints of an article that I wrote um, that you're welcome to take, and some business cards as well. So I'm passionate about public speaking. I wasn't always that way. When I was younger, I was very quiet. I went through four years of college, and I never raised my hand in class. After college and my first jobs, I never spoke in meetings. It was only as an adult uh, that I realized that I needed to work on my public speaking. And we can all improve our communication skills through practice. <coughs> public speaking is like playing an instrument or a sport. The best public speakers practice regularly. And when I say regularly, I don't mean once a year or once a quarter. I mean a couple times a week, if possible. They're out there speaking in front of people. And uh, there are plenty of opportunities to do it. It doesn't always have to be a workshop like this. I mean, sometimes it is just a meeting or a class uh, or even just a, a group of friends, a book club, for instance. Uh, but I would encourage you all to look for as many opportunities as possible to practice. Audiences admire speakers who exhibit both strength and warmth. And that's the trick, is to do it both strength and warmth at the same time. It's actually kind of hard to do. Now, we can all think of speakers who have one or the other. Can anyone think of a speaker who exhibits a lot of strength? <laughs> uh, yes? Tony Robbins. Tony Robbins, good. Another, another example? Thank you. I didn't think anyone was going to go there, but, but you did. Yes, so, he's a, so uh, President Trump is a prime example of someone who exhibits strength. And only strength, right? <laughs> only strength. So you always see him, uh, he's always speaking with the, with the helicopter going in the background, which means he's pretty much shouting, kind of barking, uh, exhibits a lot of anger when he's speaking. Uh, so that's... You know, but those are signs of strength. Anyone can think of a speaker who exhibits mostly warmth. Obama. Obama? Oprah. Oprah. Oh, I'm sorry. Oprah. Yes, good. Oprah. Uh, any other examples of mostly warmth? Generous. Ellen DeGeneres. Good. So my image of her is she's dancing, right? She's known for dancing on her show, uh, exhibiting some warmth. And uh, can you think of any examples of, of someone who does both, strength and warmth? President Obama. Any other examples? Michelle Obama. Michelle Obama. Elizabeth Warren. Elizabeth Warren. Good. So, uh, so we can think of examples of, of all three types. Now, each of us, we tend to lean in one direction or the other. Uh, we might lean in the strength direction or we lean in the warmth direction, but the point is, whatever you don't have, you can dial it up. You can practice and learn to exhibit more of it. And if you want to learn more about that, there's a great book called uh, Compelling People uh, that talks all about strength and warmth and the research that has been done on it. Today, we're going to focus on a strength tactic, uh, mastering body language so that we can exhibit executive presence projecting strength to your audience. It's a style of impression management. So all of us naturally try to manage the impressions that we make on other people. Um, so with executive presence, we're going to manage our, the impression that we're making on other people through our body language primarily. We're going to use body language as a cue to the audience as to our credibility. Um, 
We're gonna, I'm going to show you how to do that in a moment, but the first thing I want to do, just to get warmed up, as I mentioned, we're all going to have a chance to practice. We'll, we'll all, you all do it at the same time, so I'm going to hear a jumble here. Uh, go ahead. When I give you your practice topic, each of you will take a turn practicing the eye contact. And what you'll do is this. You're going to focus on one person for the length of a thought and keep talking to that person. And then when there's a natural pause, you'll move to the next person and talk to that person for the length of a thought. And when there's a natural pause, like where a comma or a period would be, you'll move to the next person and talk to that person for the length of a thought. So this is much slower than what we're accustomed to. It's going to feel like it's lasting too long. <laughs> so if you start feeling that, observe that feeling and know that that's a natural feeling, uh, but you're going to go against that feeling uh, because that more, that lengthy eye contact will signal authority. Executive presence is about deliberateness. We're trying to be more deliberate than we would normally be. And you can think of body language on a continuum from complete spontaneity to deliberateness. And we want to be uh, somewhere uh, at least in the middle or toward the other side of deliberateness. Um, things to avoid. I want you to avoid sweeping the audience with your eyes. So that's going like this while you're talking. This is very common. People think that they're making eye contact because uh, the, you know, they're, they're at eye level, but they're going <laughs> to avoid that, avoid that sweeping. The other thing to avoid is darting. Darting is when your eyes go up like that really quick. Or they go down really quick. Or to the side really quick. Um, that, that is something that we often do when we are unsure what to say or we're trying to think of numbers. But that little bit of darting can signal uncertainty or unsettledness. So the topic that I'm going to give you is to just talk about your career path. So each of you will take a turn talking about your career path with your group. When it's your turn, you'll stand up, you'll start talking, and your, uh, the people in your group will let you know how your eye contact is. I'll float around and, and give a little coaching, and then uh, after we all practice, I'll ask for a couple volunteers up here. Uh, but so coaches, coaches are the other people in your circle. What you're looking for is, are they sweeping? Are they darting? Uh, because if they're doing that, you might ask them to pause and say, and you'll say, hey, you're sweeping, you're darting. Try to be more deliberate. Pick one person to start with. And then who's your second person going to be? Any questions before we jump into this? I'm saying go to different people. If it's a big group, you can do an X shape. So you start in the back, come up here to the front, go to the back over there. It's not, so, it's not supposed to look mechanical when you do it. <laughs> yeah, it's not, <laughs> not supposed to. <laughs> By the way, I said this is about impression management, right? So one of the reasons that we do this, one of the reasons that people uh, take this cue to mean authority or credibility has to do with TV and what we see TV announcers do and politicians do. And it's often because they're working with a teleprompter. So when the president gives a speech, or at least a conventional president gives a speech, <laughs> and they're working from a teleprompter, they'll have one here, one teleprompter here. They'll have another teleprompter here. There'll be one in the back of the room. And so for a bit, they're talking here, and then they're talking here and they maintain that eye contact. On TV, it's even more eye contact. Uh, in everyday life, we're around 60% on average. Um, so we're going to try to get up above 60 for our uh, speaking face-to-face -face here in these, in these groups. Other questions? OK, so let's give this a try. I'm going to set the timer just so that we keep moving. Each person will try it for, uh, I'll give you each like a minute and a half or so. So, 
said, if you're not going to play me, I will not spend 20 hours a week working for your team. So I devoted that time back to my studies. However, that loss of that lifelong dream was a loss of identity. Good. So one of the things that happened is I kind of raised your consciousness of yourself, right? Um, so that's purposeful. Uh, we, I'm asking you not to be spontaneous, but in fact to be conscious of self. Now there's a little twist here. You want to be conscious of self, but not self-conscious. So conscious of self, but not self-conscious. Um, and that comes through practice. Other comments about this activity? Right here. Um, <clears throat> I think this is very challenging because number one, you need, first need to figure out what you're going to say, how to say it cohesively, and then you also got to think, okay, I'm going to talk to this person. Let me pop. So there's so many different things going on, and you got to be able to process that. So I think it takes practice, and, and but, but it's a great skill. Absolutely. So. This was a little, this was kind of hard because not only were you doing a new technique, but speaking impromptu, right? Um, although it's a topic that you know well, your career path. But if you were giving a presentation or a speech, you would have an opportunity to rehearse the content beforehand uh, so that in the moment you could uh, be a little more conscious of yourself. Yes? I found it more difficult, uh, strangely, from the listener's perspective than from the speaker's perspective. Because as a listener, when the speaker would make an eye contact with me, I was very tempted to look away sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and so you as the speaker, do you kind of wait for them to come back? Do you go to someone else? Or how would you, you know? Well, I think part of that has to do with just our heightened consciousness. Uh, because I said pay attention to eye contact, we're all focused on that. But in a normal setting, you're not going to alert your audience to that. You're just going to do it. And uh, generally what happens is that the audience just interprets it as good eye contact. No one feels creeped out. I mean, you would have to, <laughs> you'd have to stay on someone a long time for them to feel creeped out. And you'd probably have to get pretty close to them for them to feel creeped out. <laughs> That's the my words. Uh, another comment? I found it difficult to find that moment of pause. Mm. deliberately and to move off the eye contact onto the next passage. Right, so it can be hard to find that moment, but I will say that there is no such thing as perfection in this activity. There's no such thing as perfection. Um, as I mentioned, we are just trying to be a little more deliberate than we were before. So instead of being completely spontaneous, which might not serve our message, we're going to be a little more deliberate. And we're gonna, and if we see ourselves going off the rails, then we're gonna just coach ourselves in the moment to come back. So uh, I remember seeing one time uh, <clears throat> Bill Clinton speaking, and he was on a panel, and he's kind of slumped down in his chair, like kind of relaxed. And then at a certain moment, he sits up straight and adjusts, you know, adjusts his tie. Uh, so he coached himself in that moment, and uh, often that's the best we can do. Yeah. If you were speaking to a small group and your spiel was only 90 seconds, would you really expect to make contact with each person? Or would it go to maybe four out of six people? Like, what's the ideal in terms of how many people get direct eye contact? Uh, the ideal is, uh, well, the simple answer is no. You don't have to get everyone. Uh, the answer is just to be more deliberate and to get the people that you can get. Uh, the others who are sitting next to them will feel like the eye contact is coming to them. They'll, they'll feel that it's good eye contact. So uh, yeah, you don't have to get every last person. Yes? So you might want to give a speech in uh, 15 minutes and focus on audience member for five minutes. How do you? Oh, no, not, not five minutes, no, just the, just the length of a thought, so five minutes, yes, that's creepy, we, we can agree on that, five minutes is creepy. <laughs> oh, I, I want to talk to her. <laughs> so, you know, in, in public speaking, we don't have punctuation, right? 
It's not like when you're reading something, you have periods and commas and all that stuff. But we can still punctuate what we're saying. And we can do that with our eye contact and our body language uh, and pauses there are, and inflection. There are a number of ways to punctuate what we're saying. But, um, and all of those things can help the audience understand us. So this actually helps the audience understand what we're saying. So in this case, with eye contact, it's for the length of a thought, a phrase, you know, several words, and then moving on to the next person and talking to them for several, several words, and then moving on. Yes. Well, when speaking to people uh, in public, I have a natural tendency, I don't know if it's right or wrong, I tend to focus on people who look they're smiling to me or mm -hmm. they look, they're yeah. agreeing with me. And there are people that are sleeping or <laughs> <laughs> I try to avoid looking at them or they look angry or something like that. Should I insist with the people that are not like try like try to focus on them and try to convince them or <laughs> should I stick? You know, that's a good yeah, you don't that's a good question. Uh, I don't think you have to insist, but I think at the same time you don't know why that person is disengaged and it might have nothing to do with you and what you're saying. Um, so, you know, try you know try to work your way around the room. Don't don't consciously avoid someone just because of their body language. I have a, a, a student just recently, a student in class, kind of had closed body language. And you know, when you're in the audience, you feel anonymous, right? That's why your audience members will text and do all kinds of stuff because they feel as though they're an anonymous part of the audience. But when you're the speaker, you can see every last thing that's going on out there, including body language and texting and all of that stuff. Um, so, I mean, yes, we're aware of that, and we don't, you don't have to consciously avoid it, um, but you also don't have to press the point either. A lot, so many questions about this one. Uh, yeah, right here. Uh, <coughs> when I uh, spoke, I thought, if I'm interesting enough, so it was kind of a thought that came up that kind of distracted me from the exercise. And after I thought, after I finished, I, I thought about two things. I have a tendency to be very monotonic when I speak, and I feel maybe sometimes it's letting people uh, be less interested. And I also heard a comment from my audience that I have an accent, which I know I am. <laughs> <laughs> and I wonder if this uh, affects uh, what people perceive of what I'm saying. Absolutely. Yeah, and a single word, absolutely. So, uh, you know, we have to, as I mentioned, we don't have punctuation in public speaking. So we have to do something to help the audience know where the beginning and the end of our thoughts are. Um, we were just doing eye contact, but we can also do it with inflection, tone of voice, whether you're going up or whether you're coming down. And uh, one way to practice this is to listen to professional announcers on television or on radio and then mimic what they say, because you'll discover that they have a very wide range of ups and downs when they speak. And those ups and downs, that contour, helps the audience understand what you're saying. So you need to have that contour, and you, and you can practice it. And uh, all these things. I mean, I believe in the growth mindset, which is that you will improve if you practice. And I feel like I'm living proof, because I, meant, yeah, I told you how I didn't speak in college. Uh, so yes, you will improve through practice. I want to move on to the, the next thing, though. Let's see how we're doing on time. Good, we have a good amount of time here. I want to talk about body language. So the same thing as the, as the last one, you'll get a chance to practice this. And if you didn't go last time, start this time. So I want you to get a chance to practice with your group. So body language, two things I wanna talk about, stance and gestures. So stance, how should you stand when you're speaking? Feet, shoulder width apart, planted. What you wanna avoid is Walking and speaking like this so that you look like a caged tiger as you walk back and forth, you know, like this, this signals unsettledness, right? This signals nervousness. Uh, this, having your feet planted, signals steadiness, settled, deliberate. So that's where we want to be. Now, if you do want to walk to another place on the stage,
walk there and start talking. That walk, that walk is going to feel like a long time. But I have all of your eyes. <laughs> I have all of your I have all of your attention. Right? So someone a leader, someone with executive presence, commands the room. They own the room. They determine when it's time to move on. Okay, so that's stance. Uh, in the circle, you don't have to practice. Well, you will practice standing still, you don't have to practice moving to another spot. Um, and I would say that you can use your spot on the stage to signal a change in theme or a change in the part of your talk. You can absolutely do that. I just don't want you walking and talking. And, and actually, I think you see this on TED Talk some. I think it's a terrible habit. Um, but uh, that's TED Talks. Um, by, the, by the way, that's off the record. We're going to have to edit that out. OK, so the other thing is, is gestures. So this is what I want you to do with your gestures. Um, I want you, and it's hard to do while I'm holding the microphone, but I want your hand gestures to be simultaneous. And you're going to imagine that you're holding a ball, a beach ball, about this size. When it's time to gesture, you'll bring your hands up, and it'll be like you're setting that ball down on an important word. So I'm bringing my hands up, and I'm setting it on, on an important word. And my hands come back to my side. <laughs> well, I'm partially Italian, and I live in New Jersey, but I've taught myself to do this. Um, okay, so, so just like we need a pause when we're speaking, or a pause in the eye contact, we need a pause in gestures. And then when you want to make another good point, you bring your hands up, simultaneous, and just like that. Um, so we're using the gestures for emphasis. We're using it for emphasis. There are different styles of gestures. Uh, some people do dramatic gestures, so they're kind of act out what they're talking about. So if I say, I, I was blow drying my hair, and I'm like showing you, I'm blow drying my hair. You know? And that can, be, that can be fun, it could be funny, but that's not necessarily what a leader does, or what an executive does, right? That's a different type of, of presence. Uh, so, hands at your side, si gesture simultaneously. You're, your hand should be kind of parallel like this. So not open like this. This has a different meaning. This says, I'm at your mercy. <laughs> like I'm, you know, here I am, I'm at your mercy. Please don't murder me. You know? <laughs> uh, so that's the magic ball. Now here's what I want you to avoid while you're doing this. I want you to avoid, uh, first of all, the washing machine. I've got to set this down. So the washing machine is when you're talking about it, <laughs> and you're trying to come up with a good idea. And I see people do this all the time, especially when they're new speakers and they don't really know what to do with their hands. Don't do that. Uh, you want to avoid the fig leaf. You also want to avoid uh, what I call the perpetrator. Don't <laughs> <laughs> walk. Your hands are behind. Avoid the sad penguin. That's when your hands are like, <laughs> <laughs> when people get nervous, they do this. When you get nervous, like you, the last thing you want to do is be exposed. Um, so avoid that. Uh, anything else I need to do? I think that's, that's good for now. Um, yeah, question in the back. What about clasping your hands? Avoid clasping your hands. <laughs> Using a pen? Yeah, prop. Avoid using your pen. Anything in your hands is going to draw attention. So, yeah, so your hands are just kind of like this. Now, let me tell you, you will feel exposed. You will feel exposed when your hands are down like this. But a leader is all right with that. A leader can feel exposed. So often we're bringing our hands up just to make some distance between the audience. You know, we're doing this or whatever we're doing, just trying to keep some distance. So, okay, now it's on. Um, so the question is, what about leaning forward? Yes, you can do that. Um, you can take a step forward as well, and it's going to draw attention to uh, your your communication with the person you're talking to. 
Um, you know, anytime you reduce the space, like literally reduce the space, you're reducing the psychological space as well. Yeah, so the question was about crossing your arms. I'd say just avoid crossing your arms because as you're saying, it could give mixed signals. So why, why give that signal? Uh, yeah, we're not, uh, I mean, again, the whole idea is to be more authoritative, and more deliberate than we typically are. So we're just coaching ourselves into this other direction. Yeah, question. At the beginning of the session, you mentioned to us about being both warm and powerful. Yes. And to me, a lot of what you're saying right now is not warm, and it's not necessarily powerful either. To me, it's coming off as robotic. So how do we bridge that gap? With your holding the microphone with your hand down, that does seem powerful and warm, but when you were standing there with arms at the side like you were at the beginning, it did come off to me more robotic than warm and powerful. So how do we bridge that gap? Okay, so that's a good question, great question. So what I am showing you today are strength techniques. So this is strength, didn't show you warmth. And by the way, there's a different, you know, I, I mentioned the dramatic gestures where I'm blowing my hair, I'm, I'm uh, digging a ditch. Uh, that's an example of a different type of body language that would be more warm, because it, it's like what you'd see an actor do. Um, so you, I mean, it's something that you have to titrate for yourself. Uh, you know, if, if you are, tend to be on the warm side, then just try some of these things. Try to be a little bit more deliberate. Don't be, I'm not asking anyone to be robotic. And I think, you know, with me standing with my arms to the side, you said it looked a little robotic, maybe also because I had drawn your attention to it. So if I don't draw your attention to it, um, it will go unnoticed, uh, but noticed in a subtle way. Like you won't consciously be aware that I have my hands down, but you'll be perceiving me as more deliberate and more uh, leaderly. Our goal as speakers is always to try to fit audience expectations. So if there's one golden rule in public speaking, it's to try to fit audience expectations. Um, so what I mean for, by that is, for instance, today I knew I was going to talk about executive presence. I put on my executive costume, right? Um, I didn't have to dress this way. I could have dressed in a different way. I could have worn jeans. Uh, on a different day when I'm talking to a different group, like uh, next month I'm going to be talking to some teenagers, um, working on public speaking with them, I'm not going to show up this way because I think that's going to increase the distance between me and them. Uh, so I do think it, it's always about audience expectations. And then there is a question like, uh, you know, in the research, there's research about powerful speech versus powerless speech. And typically, people who exhibit powerful speech um, are seen as leaders, except when the expectation is that you're not going to be behave that way, when the expectation is that you're going to... Um, use powerless speech. Powerless speech, by the way, is you put tags on, like don't you think, or I think, or maybe, or you know, little tags like that that um, undermine a little bit the authority of what you're saying. Um, so I would say you have to judge it for the situation. I mean, some politicians, I mean, it's a, it, this is something that you see, there's I'm, I'm not sure, there's been research on this that you know, women who seem too authoritative are sometimes, uh, sometimes that hurts them in the workplace. Um, you know, it's not an easy answer though, so what's the other option to um, be powerless while the people around you are powerful? I don't know that that's the answer either. Um, I don't have a single answer to this, but it's a good question. All right, I want to give this a try. So uh, the theme for this is going to be just uh, a good vacation, some place that you think people absolutely must go on their next vacation. We'll pick up. If you didn't practice in front of your group already, go ahead and start. And I want you to practice these techniques that I showed you. Try to keep the eye contact going, but add the body language. And I'll tell you when two minutes is up, so we just keep moving around the circle. And, before, and give each other a little bit of coaching. So ask your group, how am I doing? Okay, ready? Okay, go ahead. Okay,
I think he's one extreme. You can have a little bit of more. All right, let's come back together, everyone. Pause there. Good job. This is good. So uh, I've, I'm seeing improvement before my eyes. Improvement before my eyes. So one of the best things that you can do to practice uh, these techniques and public speaking in general is to record yourself on video because with something like this, you will see improvement before your eyes. You will see the difference between body language. Now, I had a, a question from this gentleman right here who asked, well, do natural leaders do this naturally? And uh, the answer is? No. 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 <laughs> What's a natural leader is the question. OK, so I think this is a good point. So the answer is no. Not every leader does this. And we have two really good examples that stand out in recent history, two presidents who have very different uh, body language. Donald Trump, very unscripted, not conventional executive presence, versus Barack Obama, much more conventional in his executive presence. So definitely trained on it. Uh, and this comes back to the idea that we need to fit our audience expectations. So Donald Trump's body language, his unscripted nature, works for his base. That's what they like about him, that he's not a conventional politician, that he doesn't speak in a scripted way, that his gestures aren't uh, controlled or deliberate. That's part of what his base likes about him, um, and vice versa for Barack Obama. So the point is there's more than one way to commune with your audience. And it really depends on the audience and their expectations. Um, and what I've been trying to just show you today is just a technique, a style, a style of body language. So very executive presence is very different from comedic presence, right? So when you think about comedians, I always think about Rodney Dangerfield, you know, he's like, he was always like messing with his tie, you know, and he like didn't stand straight. A lot, of, a lot of comedians do that. What does that body language signal to the audience? It says, don't take my words seriously. That body language undermines the seriousness of the words. You know, and then there's other, when we talk about scripted, like on television, uh, you see some really scripted moves. There's one called the spider on the mirror that looks like this. Okay, I'm not asking you to do that. Don't do that. That's going to look really weird, especially for a live audience. It works OK on television. Uh, the point is that we're just trying to be a little more deliberate. Uh, any questions? I think we have like two minutes. Any questions in the last two minutes uh, right here? So the expectation for, yeah, the question is, is there a difference between speaking to a live audience and speaking in front of a camera? The answer is yes. The expectation for eye contact on camera is even higher. So close to 100%. You'll notice, you just turn on CNN, you'll see it. Um, even when they're not talking, so they'll put up three faces at the same time when they're not talking, they're staring directly at the camera. So the expectation is higher. Yes? The, the answer is yes and no. So the question was, do you have to adapt to other cultures? And the expectation for eye contact is different in other cultures. And uh, generally, the expectation is, if you do not really have the status, you cannot claim the status. So if you are a low on the status spectrum, you're not allowed to make eye contact, but the leader is. Uh, so that's usually the difference. So uh, when I teach international groups, like, yes, you have to be aware of this. Some people culturally, um, that feels really uncomfortable if you make uh, making eye contact like this. It's definitely a Western ideal. Uh, so I'll just say thank you so much for being part of this. And, uh,